Is God a white racist? That shocking sermon title got your attention, didn't it? It got my attention as well when I took a UU theology class this past semester through Star King School of the Ministries. Each week, I would have a handful of readings, and I would work my way through them, usually in the order they were listed. But as soon as I saw this title, I had to read that book first. <laughs> Is God a White Racist? Is a book written by William Jones in 1973, and it deals with theodicy. Theodicy is a cool word for an important issue. That is the question about why bad things happen to good people. It is about discussing God's goodness in face of the evidence and existence of evil. Now, I could have called this sermon theodicy, or why bad things happen to good people, but I would not have gotten your attention the same way, would I? <laughs> and this book is what got me thinking. So let me tell you about it. All of us at times find that life is not fair. And many may wonder why some people get such a raw deal in life while others seem unfairly rewarded. That question becomes all the more relevant if you are a theist and have a sense of God active in the world or God present in your life. William Jones had another pressing motivation to deal with theodicy. He's a black man, and he noticed a blatant lack of fairness in how black people had been treated, not just in this country, not just in this time, but throughout the world and throughout centuries after centuries. He researched this, and he did not like what he found there was a persistent pattern of oppression, abuse, enslavement, and genocide, which affected black people more than other races. Since Jones believes in God, this caused some concern, namely the question, is God a white racist? If not, how come people of African descent were usually being harmed while many others were allowed to be free and survive and live life unimpeded. So with good reason, Jones examines the question of God being racist or not, exploring various black theologians and their views on theodicy, the question of suffering. He decided that any theodicy which does not address black oppression and racism is not sufficient and missed the point. And none of the ones he reviewed addressed the issue of racism in relation to theodicy to his satisfaction. He wants to know if God is on his side. And so he explores this in detail. He bases his view of God on two main facts. One, oppression and genocide happened and continues to happen. And two, the will of God as revealed in scriptures. He concludes repeatedly, God apparently thinks such things are right because they occur repeatedly and he does nothing to prevent them or avenge them. You see, there are several suppositions people tend to make about God. One is, God is good, benevolent. Another is, God is omnipotent, all-powerful. It's tough to have both be true, though, in light of racial discrimination, abuse, and decimation of his people. <coughs> so which is it? Is God good or powerful, able to intervene in human lives? At times, Jones ponders, clearly a racist God is theologically impossible where God's universal benevolence is presupposed having assumed God's intrinsic goodness and justice, only two alternatives remain. Adopt a theodicy of God's benevolence or opt for atheism. I love the courage and bluntness William Jones shows in tackling the issue with such directness. Yes, there is racism. 
And yes, it is reflected in scriptures of many traditions, as well as in the history of many religions. And if we look at history overall, we find that racial and ethnic minorities are more often harassed, persecuted, abused, and killed than others. If we look in particular at people of color, this becomes not only obvious, but shocking. So yes, it needs to be addressed with eyes wide open. I love this introduction to African American liberation theology. And I plan to study this further on through the years. Yet, this is obviously an issue not just limited to African American concerns. The question could just as easily be raised by Native Americans, for instance, millions of whom were killed on this continent by whites over the last few centuries. We are UUs, and we value diversity and justice. So this is our issue. There is another reason to face the question, is God a white racist? It forces us to come to terms with our theology, the kind of belief we have. Yes, there are many humanists in this congregation whose belief in humanity may well be stronger than their belief in God. And there are agnostics and atheists among us. Still, many of us believe in God on some level, so we might as well tackle the question, what kind of God is this? We do not need to come up with just one answer, or even similar answers, of course. But we can encourage each other in our contemplations and explorations, and be inspired and enlightened by each other's different answers. Let me share my process and my answers as I tackle this. To really delve into the Odyssey, we need to ask several really basic questions. Is there a God? Is this God omnipotent, all-powerful? <laughs> Is this God omniscient, all-knowing? Is this God omnibenevolent, all-good? And in what ways does this God interfere in our lives? There are signs of evil and injustice all around us. Racism being one of them. And if God is the source of all, where does evil and racism come from? Can a good God create evil? These are theological challenges which have kept theologians and philosophers busy for many, many centuries. If we explore the writings of Augustine of Hippo in the fourth and fifth century, or Thomas Aquinas in the 14th century, or John Calvin in the 16th century, we find these theologians struggling with their view of God as opposed to the reality of the world. The assumption that God is all-powerful as well as good, and God created all there is. Yet, if we look at the world and human experience, we find human suffering and evidence of evil, like harmful decisions and actions, like racism, taken with the intention that results in others being hurt or killed and harmed in many ways. If there is such evidence of evil in the world, where does it come from? If God created evil, does that mean God is not omnipotent, not all good, after all? And if God is omnipotent, how and why would a good deity allow the righteous to suffer unjustly? Augustine declared that God created free will which caused sin, but God did not create sin itself, and it is therefore not responsible for it. <laughs> After Adam's first sin, evil was present in the human soul, corrupting it as original sin, resulting in evil. Suffering is just punishment for sin. Oh well. Centuries later, <laughs> Aquinas took it a step further, arguing that the possibility of sin is necessary for a perfect world, so individuals are responsible for their sin. He 
furthered the idea by suggesting that evil is necessary in a perfect world as it allows good to be expressed and appreciated. Mm -hmm. Kind of like you need darkness to appreciate mm -hmm. light. Mm -hmm. He suggested that if there were no suffering in the world, freedom from suffering could not be truly appreciated. Aquinas insisted that God merely permits evil to happen rather than willing it. John Calvin was influenced by these writers. The creation of Calvinist doctrine, he also held free human will responsible for evil, but added the doctrine of predestination, which could limit who could become a Christian and be saved based on their predestination. John Haig later published a long-held perspective, the Irenian theodicy, promoting a third century philosopher <laughs> and theological, theologian Irenus, that God created humans as imperfect with sin and suffering due to the beneficial results suffering can bring in human development. Therefore, God is responsible for evil, but justified in creating it. It's tough to put that into perspective of racism, though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. In all of these teachings, the premise is God's all-loving goodness and omnipotence, notwithstanding the existence of evil. This was a real tough premise to uphold in light of not only individual acts of cruelty and suffering, but acts of genocide. Many theologians began to rewrite their theologies and theodicies after each of the world wars and in light of the Holocaust. As I read Jones's book, God Is God a White Racist? I read assertions about God in scripture from Jones and the theologians he quotes, and I find them in other theologians as well. What strikes me most is the humanization of God in various authors. God was spoken about as a man, male pronouns, and human attributes abounding. We read phrases like, God wills, which implies personal humanized version of God, one who makes choices moment by moment about interfering in the lives of humans. The human imagery goes even further. When Joan stated, we also know by an immediate experience that God's hand carried us. So God has hands and God has a will. What else? Jones states, we know, however, that God is benevolent and is horrified by Auschwitz only eschatologically in light of the end of times. He then refers to God's plan for creation. Okay, so God is horrified, the horror is limited, God has plans. <laughs> the very question about God's race asking not only if God is racist, but if God is white, uses rather limiting and human terms to describe divinity. These types of statements are reminiscent of Michelangelo's image of the old man in the sky, reaching towards the human male, both white, of course, of the same size and shape as pictured in the Sistine Chapel. Artistically, it is a beautiful image, isn't it? But is that white old man in the sky the God you believe in? As humans, we would like to think, based on our human nature, that God holds our hand, values us personally, as in Rudolph's, more than others, and therefore protects us individually. That is comforting. God knows where we are and what we're thinking. Kind of like Santa keeping a list of who's naughty and nice. <laughs> And God knows what we need. We think of God as having a gender and a skin color and prejudices like we do. At least subconsciously, we may long for a theodicy, which simply sorts people into a group of those deserving suffering and a group of those <coughs> deserving, deserving blessing, or at least find blessing in the midst of suffering. <clears throat> After the world wars and the Holocaust, it is difficult to hold this naive position, isn't it? When studying the less publicized history of Native Americans, it is even more difficult to hold this as true. Yet we, as humans, have experiences in many spiritual paths of closeness 
to God, often connected with a sense of God's intervention in our lives. I know I have those experiences. I therefore want to question our view of God and God's intervention, which then creates a new theology. <clears throat> Let me propose a thought which was not considered in Jones's writing, nor Augustine and Aquinas, and certainly not by Calvin. What if God's intervention in our lives is one of relationship rather than changing circumstances? What if it is the very sense of connectedness which our spirituality provides that then allows us to feel comfort from God? What if this comfort at times allows us to cope better and feel blessed by God, but does not reflect God's active intervention? What if God is about being there with us, not doing things for us? I want to propose God beyond those human and limiting images used by Jones and those he quotes and most theologians I have read. Rather than a personal God who has a will that makes decisions and judgments, what if we use the term God for something much bigger and certainly at least as divine? How about the power of creativity and love which resides in all and connects all creation? That's a powerful phrase, isn't it? What if that is God? The power of creativity and love which resides in all and connects all of creation. This phrase does not offend even the guidelines of the non-theist humanist manifesto. This God is immensely powerful and wise and at the same time does not need to choose to connect to humans or not. It is simply there, a presence, imminently available for all humans of all races, genders, and circumstances to tap into and gain inspiration, guidance, bliss, wisdom, and strength. Humans, as well as other creatures, even the planet Earth itself, are connected to this God. <laughs> this good, divine, creative, loving energy. And yet humans are the ones who have choice. Some humans catch amazing, inspiring glimpses of this divinity and talk about it in their culture, in their time, in their limited view they are given of life and truth. These humans are involved in receiving wisdom from this loving, creative life force from God and at times collect some of this wisdom and inspiration in a form we may call scripture. Some of the scripture will use religious language, and some will sound a lot like the humanist manifesto. Whatever scripture it may be, God can be glimpsed through parts of this scripture, but other parts are often reflections of human missteps, misunderstandings, and flaws. If we start with the basic assumption that humans were created in the image of God and are a reflection of God, an easy conclusion would be that God is diverse and therefore includes various colors, features, and genders, or is beyond colors, features, and gender. All of these diverse varieties are images and expressions of God, this divine loving energy. The image I appreciate a lot in this regard is one which was presented by the UU Reverend Forrester Church. It is the image of the World Cathedral. He wrote, Welcome to the Cathedral of the World. Above all else, contemplate the windows. The Cathedral of the World holds windows without numbers. Each, in its own way, is beautiful. Some are abstract, some are representational, some dark, some meditative, 
some bright and dazzling. Each tells a story of the world, the meaning of history, the purpose of life, the nature of humankind, the mystery of death. The windows of the cathedral are where the light shines in. <coughs> what a wonderful image of different paths, different faith, whether theist or humanist or even agnostic, atheistic. Our viewpoint are the windows through which we see the light. The author acknowledges that some have trouble believing in a God who looks into any eyes but theirs. Forrester Church made it quite clear, none of us is fully able to perceive the truth that shines through another person's window or the falsehood that we may perceive as true. Thus we can easily see another's good for evil or our own evil for good. A true and therefore humble universalist theology addresses this tendency, which we all share. While speaking eloquently to the overarching crisis of our times, dogmatic divisions in an even more intimate, fractious, and yet interdependent world, it poses the following fundamental principles he puts out. One, there is one reality, one truth, one God. Two, this reality shines through every window in the cathedral and out of every eye. Three, no one can perceive it directly, the mystery being forever veiled. And four, yet on the cathedral floor and in the eyes of each beholder, reflected and reflected through the different windows in different ways, it plays in patterns that suggest meaning, challenging us to interpret and live by the meaning as best we can. Five, therefore, each window illuminates truth with a large T in a different way, leading to different truths with a small T, and these in different measures according to the insight and receptivity of the beholder. Among other things, this theology suggests that we must acknowledge the partial nature of our own understanding, respect insight that differ from our own, and not only defend the rights of others to believe their own truths, so long as they do not deny us the same privilege, but also credit them with a measure of truths with a small t, even though it may be different from the truth we embrace. So, scripture and belief and rituals, and therefore, therefore, reflect the divine truth with a capital T. Reflecting true divine light, as well as little truths, which are reflections of the specific windows through which the truth is perceived the limited human views, perspectives, and cultures. This light, this divine power of creativity and love, which resides in all and connects all of creation, shines through all things and is available to all hearts, perceived through our individual filters and windows of our <coughs> existence. As far as the Odyssey goes, Removing the human and personal qualities from our view of God, like choice and intention and intervention, puts the issue of God and suffering in a totally different perspective. That is where the MS rhythm Catholic writer Nancy Nairs inspires me. She's a poet author writing about her life, her theology, and her struggle with her crippling multiple sclerosis, which was published by our UU Beacon Press. She states, I do not believe much in a personal God. If I did, I'd have to say, God did, did this to me. Some people will say, God never gives us more than we can handle, which I think is utter shit. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because if God is doing the giving, then God routinely gives us more than we can handle. And as is one such thing. But I couldn't believe in a God who would do such a thing anyway. Her solution to the Odyssey is to give up on the humanized God. To not have a personal God. But she does this without losing any of the immediacy of support God gives her on a regular basis. Without losing the wisdom she gains from her faith. Rather than diminishing God, which religious humanists might see as the answer, we could also allow ourselves to have a bigger God. A God beyond human definition and description. A loving, creative life force, large enough to be the source of the universe and at the same time present, accessible, and meaningful. This impersonal but amazing God energy, this power of creativity and love which resides in all and connects all creation, can be available for all of us. It is beyond human images and therefore beyond accurate description, but maybe a bit like electricity. It is so close, right in the walls, behind me, for instance. Um, but unless I plug into it, I cannot experience or feel its power. And depending what appliance I plug in, I will get different results and manifestations of that power. In my own spiritual life, closing my eyes and taking a couple of deep breaths can plug me in. Taking a hike in nature seems to plug me in every time. Repeating a meditation mantra also connects me well. Singing and chanting lets me experience this power. The divine energy is right there. I believe that it does not have an agenda for my life. It does not protect me or my loved ones from harm. It does not interfere at all. But once I connect, I can feel comfort. I can feel inspiration. I can tap into wisdom and experience a deep connection to others. It is a life-changing power. It is all good, it is all powerful, yet it, that does not mean it either causes or permits evil. This God power is simply not in the permitting and intervening business. All I need to let go of in this theodicy was the personal humanized aspect of God. In my view, God is bigger than that and does not act. God just is. God is this amazing energy which can act through us if we connect to it and let it affect our being. So is God a white racist? Certainly not. There are plenty of people who are white racists, <laughs> but God is way beyond whiteness or <laughs> racial prejudice. As unfair and horrible things occur, in the world, let's not blame God for causing them, interfering unfairly or unjustly refusing to interfere to stop them. Let us tune into the divine wisdom and comfort which is available to each of us in each moment, even here, even now, and let that inspire us to intervene ourselves to stop racism, and to work for justice. Amen. So be it.